Well, thank you, Ronnie, and to the other organizers, Sarah, and everyone for giving me an opportunity to get up here and talk a little bit about uh, gene stewardship. And I would like to make a disclaimer that uh, I'm going to be giving my own opinion about uh, gene stewardship, and I am not necessarily reflecting the views of the organizers or USDA, and I, I know that I'm especially not representing the views of our recipients of our award today, based on some discussions, but I think that makes it interesting. I think what we need to do is have a discussion and get our ideas out there and, uh, you know, let the best ideas float to the top. That's what I think we need to do. I'm going to have to admit that I don't think anything I have to say today is actually new. And I, a lot of what I had to say is actually borrowed from other people. A lot of it is borrowed from our discussion that we've had, the Rust Genes Listserv. So if you hear some comments out of my mouth that you think you wrote, that's correct. I'm borrowing liberally. Um, so although maybe we don't have a lot of new things to talk about, I think that it's time that we kind of had a refresher about gene stewardship and also a pep talk about gene stewardship because I think we can do a lot of wonderful things with gene stewardship. And that kind of leads me to my title, Waste Not, Want Not. And it just reflects my opinion that if we can stop wasting resistance genes, we'll be in an excellent position to, um, to actually get to something that's sustainable. And the, uh, the second part, the subtitle, is the importance of being earnest. And that represents my opinion that this is not going to happen by accident, that we're going to have to be serious about it. And I think that there are reasons to be serious about it. And uh, actually, there's a second meaning of my title. One of my favorite plays is a play called The Importance of Being Earnest by Oscar Wilde. So that's a whole other story. But uh, anyway. So I'm going to be speaking about the, the case of UG99, but I think that what I have to say will apply to other rusts. And when the whole UG99 story started 13 or 14 years ago, the issue was that we lost a whole bunch of resistance genes. We were lacking resistance genes. And Dr. Borlaug and others in this room realized our dire situation and organized and got going and started looking for alternatives, other sources of resistance, novel ideas, some things that at the time didn't seem very plausible, but in some cases have worked out. For example, adult plant resistance. When we started this, there was SR2 and maybe somebody like Robbie thought there was more. I think a lot of us didn't think there was more but he has found more. And so we've gone from having one to maybe there's 10 loci, maybe there's more than 10 loci for adult plant resistance. This is incredible progress. Will they be durable? We, we already know SR2 is durable. You might have pretty high hopes for uh, the ones on the left there that are pleiotropic. We know they're durable for yellow rust and leaf rust. There's a good hope that they'd be durable for stem rust. The others, we don't know. In, in yellow rust, a lot of our adult plant minor gene resistance hasn't been very reliable. It hasn't been durable. What will, what will the stem rust genes do? We don't really know yet, but I hope, and I think uh, there's a good reason to hope that it will be durable. Will it need a special stewardship plan? I certainly hope not. It'd be really nice and uh, wonderful if we didn't have to worry about it. They're, they need to be together anyway, so in some sense, they kind of take care of their own stewardship. Well, we've had almost uh, equally impressive progress on the major gene side of the equation. This is just my personal list of genes that I'm kind of interested in for UG99 resistance and possibly stacking up. I'm sure that you see some genes on there that you don't like and you see that some genes you do like are not on the list. This is just kind of an illustration of the fact that there's quite a few genes out there that are effective against UG99 or in various stages of development. I say that some of them have been revived, something like uh, an SR32 uh, had a long segment and some of our geneticists, our cytogeneticists like Ian Dundas have worked hard on a, on a lot of these to shorten the alien segment and basically taking them back out of the trash bin and put them back in our hands and back in our toolkit. So an awful lot of investment has gone into this. A lot of time and money, the replacement value on this is millions and millions of dollars. And so my, 
my feeling is, and I hope it's your feeling, it would be a shame, literally a shame, if we waste these resources. So we're, we're not sure what will be the fate of these genes. Will they provide the protection that we need? And by the way, I'm gonna be speaking about major genes primarily from now on in the talk. Will they have yield penalties? Will they have quality penalties? Will they be you know, deployed in such a way that they last? Will our investments be rewarded or will our investments be wasted? Those are the questions. And so this gets back to the idea of stewardship. So I think we need to define stewardship. So in the dictionary it says that stewardship can be defined as the careful and responsible management of, of something entrusted to one's care. And I feel that these genes are entrusted to our care. You know, we, we really should be thinking that uh, there's some sort of limit on how many genes there are out there and there's people that have spent their time and effort developing them, like Ian, he has entrusted these in some sense to our care. So we should see what we can do to, to do that. In practical terms, what does stewardship mean? I think it's using the genes in such a way that they remain useful for a long period of time. And Robert uh, Parks was the one that uh, observed the stewardship and durability are inescapably related concepts. They're, they're just about the same idea. So long period of time is what we're looking for. On our listserv discussion, uh, my eyes were opened to the fact that there's really kind of a broad sense concept of stewardship and then there's a more narrow sense concept of stewardship. And the broad sense is basically everything that we in this room are doing. So broad sense stewardship has a lot of different components. Um, the first is uh, integrated disease management. We want to uh, make sure that we can keep the population of the pathogen low. We want to break green bridges. We want to use fungicides when possible. All these things reduce the population and reduce the probability that a mutant is going to arise that's going to challenge our gene. We need to know our enemy. And so uh, we need to be doing race surveys. We need to understand the biogeography. We need to understand where the hot spots are. We need to understand where the sexual recombination occurs. We need to get into genomics. We need to understand what the avirulence genes or the effectors are. All those things are helpful for us to use these genes in the most efficient and optimum way. We need to know our cultivars. We need to know them through gene postulation or genotyping with diagnostic markers. We need to analyze genetically our unknowns. We need to know our R genes. Uh, it'd be great if we can clone them and find out what their mechanisms are. If we do that, we can maybe find their matching avirulence genes if they have an avirulence gene. One of the most important things we need to know about our R genes is what kinds of synergistic interactions they may have or what type of antagonistic interactions they might have. All these things are, are things that we're already doing, and they all have a very strong impact, but uh, there's also the, the narrow sense of gene stewardship, which is the way I originally was thinking about this, which is how are we actually gonna deploy these genes to use them in a responsible manner? This is a, a diagram from an annual review by McDonald and Lindy, just showing several different schemes for deploying resistance genes. There's the uh, one at a time method on the upper left there. There's rotation in time and space. There's some sort of a, a multi-line or mixture strategy, um, mosaics of cultivars. There's regional deployment. That's a picture of Europe showing regional deployment of different genes in different countries. And then there's pyramids. The purpose of these deployment strategies is to reduce the selection pressure that the pathogen is experiencing and to increase the diversity of our system, hopefully increase the resilience of our system, and I'm sure that it does those things. But the problem is that some of those strategies actually just provide stepping stones to the pathogen. So we have to be really careful that the strategies that we use are not providing single step mutational pathways for the pathogen to acquire more virulence. And so this is one of my biggest worries is that if we concentrate on diversity alone and don't worry about the stewardship of the genes, then those genes are gonna be lost through the stepping stone mechanism. 
Well, my favorite thing to talk about is pyramids. And I think, my opinion is that pyramids have been underappreciated. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but it seems like 15 years ago or even 30 years ago, people were a little bit more interested in pyramids, and it's ironic because our technology has improved a lot. It's time to revisit the concept of pyramids. So with pyramids, we take those stepping stones and we rearrange them into a much more formidable structure, a pyramid where the different resistance genes can protect each other. And I believe, and some other people, I think, uh, believe that maybe pyramids are the best way to steward our genes. It's, it's a type of anticipatory breeding. Uh, that's what uh, our recipients today are, are well known for. We're basically, we're looking ahead to what mutants the pathogen might throw off, and we want to be ready for it. And the way we're ready for it is by having a pyramid. A pyramid, by the way, I, I didn't define. It's just a stack. It's at least two, probably at least three, four, five, whatever uh, genes together in the same line. That's what a pyramid is. So how does a pyramid break down? Well, one way that a pyramid breaks down and is not durable is if the pathogen can mutate simultaneously at all the avirulence loci and become virulent all at the same time. If the gene for gene theory is true, those events are independent. There may be some exceptions, but I think in broad general terms it's true that those, those are independent, in which case you can multiply the probabilities of those events together. So the probability of simultaneous mutation at all the loci is the mutation rate or frequency to the power of the number of genes that you've got. So pyramid power is exponential. Pyramid power is potentially nearly unlimited if you have a lot of resistance genes. And I think that we are not exploiting that power the way that we could be. So, one of the things to think about is the size of the pyramid. How, how big should it be? Bigger is obviously better. And I'm, I'm not sure what would be the minimum size that I would recommend, but I'm just gonna throw the number out there. Uh, to me, a credible pyramid is three. More is better, but if it's two, I don't really wanna call that a pyramid. Now I've got a picture here of some big pyramids and some little pyramids. The little pyramids in the front, you'll see that the two on the left look a little bit eroded. And the one on the right, the little one on the right, is looking pretty good. I think this is a pretty good analogy for what we will see with three gene pyramids. Some of them are gonna stick, and they're gonna work, they're gonna be nice, they're gonna be durable, and some of them are going to erode because the second way that a pyramid can fail is by erosion, where the pathogen is attacking a small enough pyramid that that first mutant can actually sporulate. It's especially gonna happen when we have genes that are kind of intermediate in effectiveness, like they give an infection type of two. Then it's gonna sporulate, then you're gonna have a lot of spores that are gonna challenge the next gene and you have some possibility of having that pyramid erode. But a big pyramid is gonna have very, very, very low probability of eroding from the top down. Schaefer and Rolfs had a paper in Phytopathology is a letter to the editor in 1985 about this very issue. And they did calculations of the expected size of the population, the entire population of stem rust spores in North America during a, a heavy epidemic. And the number they got was something like 10 to the 22 spores would be produced across the entire season. And then they calculated what size of a, of a pyramid would we need that could stand up if every single one of those spores landed on my pyramid and challenged it. And they had very conservative assumptions about uh, mutation rates and, and so forth. And, and the answer they came up with was six. Under the really worst case scenario with uh, very unfavorable assumptions. And later in that paper, they, or letter to the editor, they said, well, really probably five would be okay. Well, I'm with them there. I go for that. I like that. I say five. Five is a good number for me. I feel pretty happy. I'd bet a lot of money on five in pyramid if they're all good genes and if we have 
eliminated the stepping stone pathways that could possibly erode that, that pyramid. One thing I did want to say is that hot spots um, are going to need extra care. A pyramid of three might work fine in North America, where the stem rough is not throwing off very many new races, at least except for Pullman, Washington. Um, but in East Africa, no way is a three-gene pyramid make me feel good. I, we have to have either don't put them there at all or put them in a big pyramid. So what I'm suggesting is that our priorities, at least for some resistance genes, are backwards. We've been saying we have to protect the crop. Let the genes do what they're going to do. We hope they're durable, but what has happened is they have been lost. Their effectiveness has been lost. And then, ironically, the crop is no longer protected. So I say let's reverse that. Let's protect the genes. And if we protect the genes, then the crop will be protected as well. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to do this on every gene. By the way, if you're sitting next to a breeder, tap them on the shoulder and wake them up. I'm sure they've tuned me out by now, and I want them to come back and pay attention to the next part here, okay? I know you think I'm crazy breeders, and, and Dr. McIntosh. Uh, so I think we have a conflict here of philosophies, and I want to do some things that you don't want to do, and I think we can both do what we want to do if we have different groups of genes that we steward in different ways. So there are some genes that we probably don't need to have any program whatsoever, and I, and I hope that the APR genes and older genes, genes that have been deployed for a long time, SR24, maybe we don't even need to consider them at all. Just let them do whatever they're going to do. Uh, they, don't, they aren't threatened. And then there's going to be another pool of genes, genes that I like, that I would like to preserve, like SR26 and SR22, SR35, but they're kind of out the door already. Everybody's already got those, and you, and you have to give the breeders something to use. So there's a pretty good-sized group of genes that are out in people's hands right now, and you can let them use those genes and do the best they can. We should support them and try to help them do better than, than maybe they would have done. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But a common pool, we got to have it for people that want to do forward breeding and don't want to be tied down by any rules or anything. OK, it's a recommendation to them that they take better care of those genes. But I would like to propose that we have a third pool, which is reserve genes, and we would have to agree which genes those are, which won't go out unless there's some sort of a strategy or some sort of a um, stewardship plan that goes with it. So the reserve pool would be in some sort of a bigger pyramid. So this is the, my list again, and most of the genes on this list will be in the, in the second pool, the common pool. They're already out the door. Or maybe we can discuss uh, you know, what's going to happen with them. I would nominate two to go into the pool. There's two that are being worked on in Manhattan, Kansas by Dr. Freeby to try to shorten the segments right now. They're, they're long, but he's using PH1B to try to shorten them. It's SR44 and SR51. I'd throw those out there as two that maybe we should put them in the reserve pool. We have a, a, a few Tashii genes that we've been working on. Maybe Tashii isn't a good candidate for this, but maybe it is. Those genes might be nice. They might have less linkage drag since they're from Tashii. But anyway, this would be something that could be discussed, which genes could be reserved. What I think we have is enough genes already here and enough genes in the pipeline that it's kind of a win-win situation. Everybody can have the genes they need. This is the benefit of the huge effort that's been put in to the BGRI, is that there's been a lot of success in finding genes. So my specific, uh, specific proposals are that we need to have better international support, and I'm talking about money from large organizations that have a lot of money, to support the common pool. So the common pool could be supported 
by making sure that every breeding program, if they want it, if they ask for it, can get good genotyping. And the cost of genotyping is always going down, so the cost of providing this service is always going down, and I don't know what the details would be, but I know we're trying to build genotyping labs in a lot of places. What are they for? They should be for trying to put together combinations of genes, not just one. Two is okay, but three is better. Four is even better. So I think we need more support for anybody anywhere who's trying to put genes together. I think we have to have some sort of money for monitoring to see how we're doing so that when there's candidates, variety candidates coming out, they need to be tested to see what's in them. And again, the cost of doing that is, is lower. And I think we should have some sort of a plan for helping people. If they have something that they really like, a wonderful background, but it doesn't quite have all that it needs is a rapid fix where we can put what, we can beef up the, the, uh, the set in there. So, and then of course the second thing is I think we should have a reserve set and I would say that it should be shared with whoever is a responsible party. Anybody who wants it should get it, but they have to follow whatever rules we would set for dealing with the stewardship on that particular thing. So, with stewardship, it's uh, important to understand that any cultivar with an unprotected gene can potentially ruin your plans. The chain is only as strong as the weakest link. And so what that means is that we are all in this together. We have a common interest in protecting our common resources. And uh, somehow or other, uh, I think we need to have a discussion about this and decide whether we want to have a higher level of stewardship and exactly what that's gonna look like. And I understand from the organizers of next year's meeting in Obergon, the 2014 meeting, that there will be additional sessions where we will have deeper and uh, more extensive discussions about gene stewardship. In the meantime, a shameless promotion. Uh, we do have our listserv on Google Groups where we're having these discussions and uh, everyone's welcome to, to join. The email load isn't too bad, I don't think. We have kind of fits and starts on our discussions, but if you are interested in joining in the discussion, please send an email to either me or my co-conspirator around the rust genes, uh, John Backham. So I started off with the old adage, waste not, want not, and I'm very sure that uh, Dr. Borlaug would have really appreciated the sentiment anyway, maybe not the particulars, the sentiment of waste not, want not. And he certainly would have approved of our subtitle, my subtitle, The Importance of Being Earnest, because if anybody ever understood the vital importance of being earnest, it was Norman Ernest Borlaug. So that's it, thank you very much.